Thank you. Thank you so much. So quick show of hands. Who is sitting here thinking, I'm a systems thinking ninja. I know everything there is to know about systems thinking. See no hands. Oh, see one hand. Talk to you later. Definitely. Who's sitting here thinking, hmm, systems thinking. Not sure. Sounds good. Two buzzwords. Don't know what to do with it. Show of, on a show of hands. Yeah, see more hands going up. And who's sitting here thinking, I want to have dinner with a stranger later. Let's go on with the talk. Right. Like Justina said, we want to walk in a systems wonderland. But the reality is, for a lot of us as product managers, engineers, agile coaches, scrum masters, we're walking in a tunnel when we're developing products. And what I mean by that is that we're very used to starting small. We try to avoid the big oil tanker and instead really try to act as speedboats. And that means that we're hyper-focused. We want to start small. We walk in that tunnel. We are thinking as small as we possibly can, because that's, we just heard it from Esther Der Derby, that's the agile mindset. Let me give you an example. I don't know if you're familiar with a brand called Joan the Juice. It's a, it's a well-known chain of shops where you can get lovely fresh juices and they have a loyalty app. Now imagine being the product manager working on this Joe and the Juice loyalty app. You can imagine that that person trying to be the best product manager they can be is completely laser focused on making the app as good as it can be. Iterating constantly, making sure that Joe and the Juice has got the best loyalty app that there can be. What they don't necessarily take into account when working on the app is the experience that a Joe and the, Joe, a Joe and the Juice customer can have when they go into one of the Joe and the Juice shops. Quality of the fruit, right? Can look like this on a, on a bad day. Or the juicers in store, the experience that they have with the people making their juices. These are all elements or nodes as system thinkers would say, that form part of a bigger system, which is customer loyalty. You've got all these different nodes, part of that system, and the loyalty app that this product manager or an engineer is working on is just a part of that bigger system around customer loyalty. Today, we're going to talk about how we define a system and then zoom in and how we manage a system. So let's start talking about what a system actually is. And I really like this definition by one of the original systems thinking pioneers, a lady called Donella Meadows, who says, a system is a set of related components that work together in a particular environment to perform whatever functions are required to achieve the system's objective. Now, what that means, if you think about it, is that as product managers, but as engineers, scrum masters, we're very good at analyzing, taking a big, hairy, complex problem and breaking it down into small pieces. If you go back to that definition of what a system is, those sets of components working together towards achieving a common goal, it means that we have to move away from analysis breaking things down into smaller pieces, to synthesis and really spend time understanding how the different pieces come together to achieve a bigger objective. Going back to the Joe and the Juice example, the bigger objective there was customer loyalty and that customer loyalty app that that product manager was working on was just one of the pieces. I want to bring system thinking to life. So what I will be doing as well is share some of my own personal use cases and examples of how you can take that thinking about systems and really apply it. Going back to what Justina said earlier, what is it that you can be, be, able, will be able to do when you go back to work on Monday? My first use case that I want to share with you is how you can use systems thinking to better understand the context. So I'll give you an example. I um, was interviewing for a job, which I'm now doing actually, 
and the job was working for, is working for a digital banking platform, an engagement banking platform. And I was like, not sure how much I actually know about an engaging en engagement banking platform. Where do I even start? Because, you know, they want you to do a case study and you have to prepare for the interview. And what I did, and I've done this in lots of different contexts, contexts is just take a piece of paper and start jotting down what I know about the system of digital banking. And it always amazes me when I do these exercises, with, whether it's with colleagues or do it on my own, as soon as you start thinking, digital banking platform, what are the other systems? What are the nodes in that system? Before you know it, you've broken it down like this, right? And it's not about getting the right or wrong answers, but it's really understanding what the context is of a product. Systems are dynamic, they're evolving, they're connected. Those are the three main characteristics of a system. It's dynamic, it's always changing, it's evolving, and it's connected, meaning that you have different parts of a system that are all related to each other. And if you think about those three characteristics of a system, evolving, dynamic, connected, then suddenly you realize that a lot of things that we use or see in everyday life are systems, whether it's the United Nations, your PlayStation, or Spotify Discovery. What it also means is that we're constantly zooming in and out. We're looking at the bigger picture, understanding the broader system, and then going into the detail of the different elements that make up a system. Give you another example of a product that I'm sure we're all familiar with, LinkedIn. If we treat LinkedIn as a system, and we start looking at all the different nodes that make up that LinkedIn system, so whether it's your people network on LinkedIn, recruitment, marketing solutions, all different nodes that make up that broader LinkedIn system. Key thing is when you look at systems, apart from defining nodes, is that you set boundaries. So you can imagine that if you work at LinkedIn as, let's say, a product manager, you might be worried about the impact of the global financial eco economic climate and what that might do for LinkedIn. The reality is that you're not gonna be able to influence that. And if you let that in, even though it's a relevant factor, your system becomes unmanageable. So it's really important that you set a boundary in saying, these are the elements, these are the nodes of the system that I'm gonna look at, and this is outside of the realm of the system that I'm working on, right? It's the outside world. When you, go, when you stay within that, so you've, you've defined your broader picture, you go into these different nodes, you start seeing the relationships between the different elements of a system. So think about it, as soon as your people network grows, I don't know if you have this experience, but you start seeing number of marketing solutions, i.e. people spamming you, increasing, right? Which in turn actually means that maybe you start kicking a few people out of your network. But that's a very simple example of the relationships between the nodes within that LinkedIn system. Once you start looking at those relationships and you understand the dynamics between different elements, like I said, the example of your people network and marketing solutions, you'll be able to start identifying points of intervention where you can maybe make changes. You can see friction within the system that you can remove. So building on that, my second personal use case that I want to share with you of a concrete example where I applied systems thinking was when I was working at a London-based property tech startup and worked with engineers, designer, and we really wanted to understand the process of buying and selling homes in the United Kingdom. And what we did was, again, as a group, started mapping all the different nodes of that system from people putting their home in the market or buyers looking at homes and going on online marketplaces or going in person 
to the point of people making a bid for a home and having their offers accepted. And then you get the whole, I don't know what it's like in Poland, but then you get uh, surveys and people looking into the state of their property and drainage and all kinds of things. And what we learned from that process, we even had a lawyer doing this exercise with us. There was a lot of post-it notes involved, I can tell you that for sure. But we really identified the points of friction within the system, which is, as you can see marked here, the point around conveyancing and searches, i.e., the problems that would be found when people came to do a property search. They looked at, they found issues with a tree in the garden. But this would always happen after a bid on a house had already been accepted. And what would happen is a lot of frustration for both the buyers and sellers, because they didn't know about all these hidden problems that were found out through property searches or people doing surveys. And the ultimate consequence that a lot of these property transactions would fall through or they would take a long time at best. So from doing the exercise, we figured out, well, hold on, why don't we try to mitigate that problem, prevent that problem from happening, these kind of unexpected surprises around your property, by doing all the conveyancing and the property searches and surveys upfront, so that there's no surprises for the buyers and sellers. And if you're selling a home and you find out very early stages that you've got uh, a tree, uh, you know, defective tree in your garden that's causing everything to the whole construction to fall down, so to speak. You can try to solve for that. But it's a simple example of really trying to understand what is the broader system, what's happening here, and where can we see points of intervention if we want to resolve some of the friction that we see in that system. So if we define a system, it's a collection of nodes, different elements of a system. It's about the interconnections and the feedback loops between parts of the system. And as we saw with the LinkedIn example, a system is always contained by boundaries. And we'll see later again why it's important to have those boundaries in place. So we defined what a system is. Now, how do we manage a system? What does that mean? I've given you two examples already, but what, what does it mean? Again, another system thinking pioneer called Russell Aikoff says, to manage a system effectively, you might focus on the interactions of the parts rather than their behavior taken separately. What Aikoff is talking about is synthesis versus analysis. Synthesis, we look at the different pieces and see how they come together to form a bigger whole. Now, the risk with that is that if you look at the interactions between the different parts of the system, we're not being agile. We're trying to cover way too much. So it is important, like I said before, to draw very clear boundaries, saying these are the problems or these are the parts of the system that we're going to cover, and this is outside of our sandpit. We're not going to touch that. Can't influence it, makes it unmanageable, it's way beyond our pay grade, not the right people in the room, but it's really important to have boundaries when you're looking at a system. Give you a concrete example. If you work at Spotify, music discovery, there's a, a number of aspects there that form part of that Spotify music discovery system. So think about human curation, think about user preferences, tastes, music streaming, machine learning. But equally, there's a lot of things outside of that where you can say, actually, I'm not going to focus on that. I want to keep it manageable. I really want to make sure I spot the right points of friction and points of intervention. So therefore, things like user account management, royalty payments, reporting outside of the boundary of my system that I'm going to work on. We talked about the interconnectedness and the relationships between parts of a system. And that's a really key part that we need to take into account when we think about how do we manage a system? How do we understand a system? It's about causality. It's a classic thing of actions having results. And what we're doing with systems thinking is that we're really understanding how the different parts of a system can have consequences. Sometimes parts in a system, a bit like the Joe and the Juice example, that you're not even conscious of. Something is happening over the, here and it's having a massive impact over there. But you only see that and you see that causality when you start mapping it out. 
And that's the first thing that we can do to really zoom in to understand that causality is to look at feedback loops, cause and effect. Now, there's two types of feedback loops. You've got a reinforcing feedback loop and a balancing feedback loop. So a reinforcing feedback loop is it reinforces. It takes something, an effect, and it reinforces, makes it bigger. Just a simple example is if the number of births per year goes up, the population will increase. And as a result of a population increasing, the number of births will continue to grow, right? So it's a reinforcing loop. Now, that sounds great, but longer term, that reinforcing effect can obviously lead to instability. Give you an example. If you think about a product where you can really, this is a subscription service, and what users get is coffee beans, vitamins, all kinds of products. And because they also get the scales, the company actually knows what your preferences are, how much of a certain coffee blend you're using, when you're about to run out so they can send you a new pack of coffee beans or maybe similar similar blend. If you're really using a lot of one blend and they'll say, well, let me recommend another one to you. So you can see that the more customer data they get, the more accurate and timely their recommendations can be. That is a reinforcing feedback loop. Now that sounds great, right? More customer data I get, the accuracy and the timeliness of my recommendations goes up. I told you that reinforcing feedback loops can also be destabilizing. I don't know if you've come across this example from Target, where actually the recommendations were getting so accurate, i.e. someone was buying a lot of, I think it was a special vitamins and Target had developed this internal pregnancy prediction score saying if a person buys X a number of these products within a certain time frame, they must be pregnant. And it was so accurate that the parents of this teenage girl who was buying that vitamin product knew that she was pregnant because suddenly Target was sending all kinds of coupons for diapers and what have you before the teenage girl had actually told them. Now, you can see that's a very simple example, again, of that reinforcing feedback loop going wrong, because then the tendency for people to actually share their customer data is going to decrease. So to counter all that, you've got the second type of feedback loop, which is a balancing feedback loop. It's a self-correcting feedback loop. Think about your th thermometer, where you set a target temperature that you want in your room or in your house, and the th thermometer will self-correct as soon as it sees that the actual temperature is going above or under the target temperature that you want in your room or in your house. So it's a balancing effect there. And I don't know if you've come across any of these kind of budgeting and uh, apps. That's exactly what they do. If you set your saving goals, they will start sending you alerts to say, well, Mark, you didn't meet your goals this this month or you're spending way too much, equally they will nudge you if you see that if, if the app sees that you're going in the right direction with the saving goals that you've set yourself. But that's a, a product example, if you like, of a balancing feedback loop. Again, it will self-correct. A second way of zooming into your system and the relationship between the different nodes of your system is the iceberg model. Who's familiar with the iceberg model? Other than that, we've obviously all seen an iceberg, at least maybe in real life or in pictures. Because what the iceberg is, it forces us to really think about what's happening under the surface. We all see certain events happening. We might see sudden drop off in usage of our product for example, but what's really sitting underneath that? What's really happening here? What are the specific patterns or trends? What structurally is wrong or what's causing the event to happen? And what mental models 
are we spotting? Right? And we do need to time. It's, you know, it's very easy when you look at data, for example, to, to observe that something is happening. Like I said, people are not using your product anymore, or they are starting to use your product quite a lot. But in either case, we often don't know what's sitting underneath that. And thinking about these layers underneath the actual event, so the pattern, the structure and the mental models can really give us a lot of insight and can help us to create better products or maybe re resolve some friction in our products. So think about an event that we are all, I assume, familiar with, which is social media that's still overproduced, very inauthentic. You know, everyone is, looks amazing on social media. Why is that? What's happening here? If we go underneath the surface, we can say, well, there's a pattern here. People are being less authentic. Why is that? Well, there might be a structural problem of peer pressure. Young people, particularly on TikTok, feeling that they have to fit in. They have to you know, live up to a certain standard that's been set on these social media. And then if you go one level below that, you look at the mental models and this kind of idea of, I need to create, whenever I go online, I need to create a perfect picture of myself. Right? And that will make me feel better, make me feel like I'm fitting in. And you can see that apps like Be Real have tapped into that. They've done that exercise. And what they're trying to do is to really enable people to be their authentic selves and be uh, who they want to be, not having to feel like they have to fit in. And they've deliberately designed the app in that way where you have to record something in two minutes at a set time. And that is it. Third use case I want to share with you is how you can use systems thinking and the iceberg model like we just saw to communicate the problem. It's an alternative way of explaining to people what the problem is and whether you actually use the iceberg but to show to people or just use it as a, as a tool, as a mechanic to understand really what the problem is. Do your root cause analysis. I had this example, real life example, and I was working at Intercom, which is a customer support platform. And I worked on bots. And what we were seeing is that there was the event that we observed was low bot activation. Lots of people, lots of companies buying our chatbot products, creating a bot, but not setting them live, i.e. not enabling their end users to use the chatbot. When we went underneath the surface and we started talking to both our customers and their consumers, there was clearly a problem of a creator bot, but I'm not comfortable setting it live just yet. Right? And our customers, people in customer support teams, they just were nervous about the automated experience, thinking that's going to harm my company or that's going to harm my brand or it's going to harm my customer experience. And the mental model right at the bottom was about, well, we're not sure what the value is that this bot will bring. Will there be a negative impact on my customers? And that re really helped my team and I internally to explain not only what the problem was, low bot activation, but also tell a story of what the underlying reasons were and how we could tackle those in terms of training our customers, making onboarding and setup of bots much easier, giving people examples and templates to take away some of the underlying problems or reasons that we'd identified. The third and final way of, or method you can use to zoom in to relationships, to parts of your system is not a bathtub, promise you, but the bathtub is actually a good metaphor for what the third and final method is, which is a flow diagram. And if you think about system as water in a tub with an inflow when you open the tab and the water comes in and an outflow, water coming out of the bath, that's what we're looking at. And the water in the tub and how quickly the water goes through the bath, how much water is in the bath, that's all systems thinking. That's your system, that's your stock, as, product, uh, as systems thinkers would say. Going back to the LinkedIn example, if you apply that flow diagram thinking, is 
if LinkedIn user data is your stock, that's, your, that's effectively your system right there in the middle, the input comes from the data from your LinkedIn profile, the job preferences that you might enter into the system. The outflow is recruiters getting in touch with you, recommendations for jobs, right? It's another way of thinking about how the different elements in the system and how these inputs and outputs work in a system like LinkedIn and how it affects the stock in the flow, which is user data. My fourth and final personal example of how you can use systems thinking is to gain different perspectives. So effectively, you're using systems thinking as a communications tool. Again, at Intercom, one of my team members was rolling out with, with her team of engineers and designers a product that enabled uh, chatbots to pull in information from third-party systems. So customers typically have lots of different systems and they can pull, pull in data into the chatbot. So when customers would, for instance, ask about the status of their uh, takeaway order, you know, companies like Just Eat, um, they have lots of external systems and they could just pull in that data. And my product manager had made some assumptions of what the impact would be. So the expectation was that our customer, our customer support team at Intercom would get a lot more questions from customers. And like, how do we integrate with our third party systems? How does this work? Help us out. Uh, we'd expect we get a lot more happy customers because it's something they really wanted because it would help the chatbot experience by pulling in that external data. We knew we'd had to train customer support to deal with some of the questions. There'd probably be a lot more API related tickets because this was an API product. But we did that exercise. And what my product manager then did was actually take some of those learnings to work with the different teams and say, well, is that right? Do we think we need more training, for example? Do we expect more API issues? And what we got was this, like, no, hold on a minute, it's a lot more than what you thought about, right? But we use that thinking to really preempt what the kind of reinforcing effect would be or the impact would be of rolling out this feature. And then using it again as a communication tool to go around the different teams within Intercom and saying, what do you think will happen? What do we need to prepare for? And they came up with a lot more things than we did initially thought of. But again, we got that view because we looked much bigger. We looked at the different parts of the system. So when we talk about managing a system, it's really important to zoom in and zoom out into parts of the system. There's three ways to zoom in. So we looked at um, feedback loops. We looked at the iceberg model and we looked at flow diagrams. And doing that, zooming in, zooming out, will help us to identify friction and to spot opportunities to intervene into the system. Going back to what you can do on Monday when you go back to work, because you might be sitting here thinking, well, this is all great. Where do I get started? Think about your product. Start just very simple. Start looking at all the different nodes that you can think of. Again, this is not about the right answer, the wrong answer. This is just really thinking about what are the different nodes in my system, whether it's sales enablement, marketing solutions, think about the different elements, but think beyond just your product. Do it as a collective exercise, whether you do it in a room, whether you do it on a mirror board or any of these collaboration tools, the idea is that you do this as a group with the right people in the room and start looking at those relationships, looking at those feedback loops, whether it's reinforcing or balancing. Because right? once you do that, you set your boundary, you look at the relationship, you start seeing potential points of in intervention where there's opportunity to optimize or maybe there's a friction in the system that you need to remove. Right? Because when you're doing the exercise, don't forget that your part, your product is part of a whole. It's part of a bigger system and you have to zoom in and out to see those intervention. And like we saw, linear thinking doesn't apply because you're looking at connections between parts of the system. Right. And don't worry 
one big piece of advice here. Don't worry if it gets very messy very quickly. Because what you're doing is you're trying to understand and solve very complex problems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark.